Post-Cold War era has seen a great shift in space-based militarization. Unlike the first period of military space innovation, however, this was no longer a race into the unknown, but now into an established landscape. Since the fall of the USSR and its military space apparatus in the 1990s, the United States would not only embed its military operations further into space, but also the whole of the global economy, placing defense, finance, and communication systems all in orbit. Space is critical, not just to U.S. national security, but our economic security. There's so much for our daily life. I mean, we don't even think about how embedded space is in our daily life. It's used to carry military communications, to take images that is then used for intelligence and analysis. There's uh, weather satellites was the foundation of early warning for hurricanes and everything else. And uh, there's this one study that looked at the economic impact of uh, remote imaging from space for farmers. Being able to see and plan and master the territory, that economic impact is in the billions of dollars for just one parcel of land in the Midwest. Space allows you to detect a potential adversary, target that adversary, and then place uh, munitions and destroy the target. Navigations, communication satellites, which is the foundation of global TV. Um, each GPS satellite has an ultra-precise atomic clock on it, and these timing signals are used in everything from financial transactions, and so when you use your, your credit card at the gas tank, to uh, emergency services and, and communications. And were we to lose access to those communications systems, the GPS satellites, it could have a tremendous negative impact on economic activity here on Earth. Space is just part of our overall, how our, our culture and our economy functions. This established economic environment has changed the game from simply a race to enter space to now a landscape the U.S. must attempt to maintain dominance of, while emerging space powers seek new ways to deny the U.S. its status. I mean, that's the biggest problem that we are facing now is the question of, are we facing a new wave of anti-satellite weapons from China and Russia? What do we do about it? To understand the modern period of space militarization, one must first understand the modern catalog of counter space technologies. These technologies are built to disrupt, degrade, and destroy space systems both in orbit and on the ground. Reversible activities are activities that will temporarily impair a space system, but within a couple of hours or a couple of days, um, it, the satellite would be back online. Uh, Non-reversible is that you permanently take out or destroy a satellite. This is important as in an assault using a non-reversible tactic, the target's equipment will be permanently damaged and may be more likely to trigger escalation. In a reversible approach, one can scale up and down the level which they choose to antagonize the enemy's assets. Both of these types of ASAT activities have multiple tools at their disposal. In jamming, a country simply emits signals on the same frequency band as a satellite to prevent GPS or communications from reaching enemies' assets. This common tactic can be seen in many places, including the South China Sea, where China has set up these systems on the Mischief Reef Islands. Spoofing, another electronic warfare tactic, is similar to jamming, but instead of simply blocking transmissions, the emitter will deliver false information to the targeted asset. This was seen in practice when a team of UT Austin students were able to fake GPS information delivered to a yacht in the Mediterranean, providing the wrong GPS information to cause it to steer off course. Another reversible tactic is using a limited form of lasers to temporarily blind or dazzle enemy satellite sensors, sometimes requiring it to recalibrate. In the category of non-reversible ASAT activities, there is two forms that it can be broken down into. One category of these are kinetic, where an actor uses some kind of physical asset to assault an enemy system. 
For the direct descent variants, these include objects like missiles launched into low orbit to directly hit a satellite from a plane or from the ground. These also include nuclear blasts, that's radius could disable surrounding satellites. For co-orbital satellite operations, an actor would place their own satellite, like the Pebble program or Istra Beto Sputnikov program, which could act on an enemy target when synced with the target's orbit. Co-orbitals can remain dormant for up to years and can attack enemy satellites with robotic mechanisms, missiles, ramming with or without explosives, and chemical sprayers. Non-reversible weapons can also be non-kinetic, including electronic warfare, which often uses high-power microwaves and electromagnetic pulses and direct energy warfare, using lasers to permanently damage solar arrays or satellite sensors. Cyber attacks can also be considered both reversible and non-reversible, depending on the type of hacking involved. In developing these weapons, the term dual-use technology frequently comes up. Um, so the, we call this the dual use nature of space in that things that seem peaceful or non-aggressive in its purposes could actually be used in a more aggressive uh, weaponized way. And so because a lot of the space uh, assets are dual use, it's very difficult sometimes to tell whether something is a weapon or isn't. It isn't a weapon and, and it's often in the eye of the beholder because it, it really is sort of in the intent. When the space shuttle was being built in the 1970s, the Soviet government was actually concerned that it was an anti-satellite weapon because it had the Canada arm uh, in it and that Canada arm could have been used to grab onto a Soviet satellite and destroy it. In May 2018, there was an estimated 1,880 satellites in orbit of Earth owned by countries or multinational organizations. Out of all these countries, the main three were the United States, China, and Russia. The US, Russia, and China are the most advanced, having done the most investment, having spent the most amount of time, these sort of things. Russia, China, and the United States are all trying to develop at least defensive systems uh, for satellites. With these top three countries' satellite portfolios, it is clear that while the US and China have invested the bulk of its resources in intelligence and surveillance, Russia has invested more heavily in communications. Despite these categories, however, China and Russia are believed to have military oversight and control over these non-military satellite systems, as well as potentially the private sector satellite systems in their countries. The Russians and the Chinese, they came to the understanding that the key to American conventional military superiority was outer space. And if they could deny the United States and its allies access to outer space, they could achieve conventional advantage um, here on Earth. It should be noted in the following breakdown that due to the advanced military nature of this field, the more recent these examples are, the more classified their details are. It is impossible to truly know everything that is or isn't happening in this field today. The following analysis is a compilation of various reports, and the full details of many remaining unknown or classified. For further details, please check our episode's bibliography. China's space program is quickly growing, with a moon rover, its own GPS system, and has manned two prior space stations. In 2018, they had 38 launches opposed to the United States 34. It has been publicly stated that space is a key part of China's plan for expansion. Chinese military scholars wrote in 2007 that space dominance will be a vital factor in securing air dominance, maritime dominance, and electromagnetic dominance. It will directly affect the course and outcome of wars. You know, it's, it's clear the Chinese have had a desire to assert themselves as a, a great power on the same plane as the U.S. and Russia. And part of the way it's done that is, in the, especially since the 90s, is to develop space programs that don't have explicitly military intent, like the human space program, as well as developing the capability to de deploy missiles and, and anti-satellite weapons. Originally, the People's Liberation Army, PLA, would operate space operations. But since the SSF was created for its space, cyber, and electronic warfare missions, China's capacity has grown quickly over the last decade, demonstrating this to the world in 2007. Um, in 2007, China had their big ASAT test, uh, 
um, that created a huge cloud of debris, which is still um, on orbit and is incredibly dangerous. So I think it, it, part of that is demonstrating that they have that capability. Yeah, and it goes back to deterrence. Uh, in order to convince a country not to do something, you have to convince them that you have the power to keep them from doing it or to punish them if they do. Um, and so unless you demonstrate that you have a capability to do something, how's another country going to know that you have it? So I think for them, it was a lot about demonstrating that, hey, we can do this. The establishment of the U.S. Space Force, the reestablishment of U.S. Space Command, it's really a result of China's 2007 anti-satellite test. That is the beginning of what I call the second space security age. The first age was during the Cold War. The second age, you could date its origins to China's 2007 ASAT test. China was called out in the international community for this and has since not repeated such a test to scale. However, it is suspected that they have been doing DN-3 ASAT missile tests in 2015, 16, 17, and 18, according to U.S. officials, often against simulated ICBMs. China's co-orbital capacity is unconfirmed, but potentially ongoing. The SJ-12 satellite conducted a series of maneuvers around SJ-06F in 2010, at one point making contact. Some observers question if this is a similar practice to the former Soviets' tests, or simply on accident. Aulong-1 would launch in 2016 with an attached robotic arm with the official purpose of picking up space trash, a purpose which some have questioned if it may have dual-use purposes. China's use of direct energy lasers and microwaves are still in question, though there are some cases that seem to point in that direction. In 2005, Chinese scientists claimed to have successfully blinded a satellite in a test of a 50 to 100 kilowatt mounted laser. Then, in 2006, U.S. imagery satellites were illuminated by lasers while passing over Chinese territory. China has been known to have robust cyber capabilities. Beyond simple jammers and mischief-free from the South China Sea, there has also been a number of accusations against China's cyber attacks. The U.S. Geological Survey Landsat 7 ground comms in Norway had an attempted hack to take over the satellite's controls. In 2008, NASA's Terra Earth observation was also hacked in a way that the hackers acquired all the steps needed to issue commands, though no commands were sent. In 2014, the National Oceanography and Astrophoric Administration Satellite Weather System was forced to shut down for two days due to a cyber attack. In 2017, the Indian government claimed to have their video chat system compromised by Chinese hackers. In 2018, a private U.S. company claimed that they were attacked by hacking forces within computers based in China. Russia's program after the Soviet Union was in deep decay, politically, financially, and physically. Even one of its bronze space shuttles and storage would be destroyed as its hangar collapsed in on itself. Since then, the new Russian Federation has rebuilt its satellite system and its general space infrastructure with its aerospace force and Roscosmos. You know, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, the Russian military was really starved for resources. Though with the increase in oil prices in the early 2000s, um, the Russian military has been much better funded than it was in the 1990s. Since this resurgence, Russia has been both identified as developing counter space assets, as well as publicly announced many on its own. The Russians have always viewed space-based missile defenses as an existential threat to their strategic nuclear deterrence. And if you look at their actions, especially in the diplomatic field, their space diplomacy is fundamentally designed to achieve one key goal, limit the ability of the United States to deploy space-based missile defenses. There is a concern that with America's advanced technology, we could at some point in the future deploy a constellation of space-based interceptors that could negate Russia's strategic deterrent. Missiles in the arsenal that may have ASAT capabilities include the S-300, S-400, and S-500 missiles, though this has yet to be publicly demonstrated. 
Additionally, in 2018, it was believed that a photographer had identified a MiG-31 allegedly with ASAT missiles, similar to the USSR's original plan to launch a MiG-31 with ASAT capacities named CONTACT to match the US F-15 satellite ASAT test. Some estimate these could be operational as soon as 2022 against low Earth orbit satellites. A number of co-orbital technologies have been identified in the modern Russian portfolio. The satellite Olim Cave has been identified as moving in unpredictable patterns, approaching American satellites for unknown reasons. Cosmos 2499 has been nicknamed Kamikaze for its potential ramming capacities. Russia has had a couple of satellites in orbit that have come very close to our, our military satellites. And we call that rendezvous and proximity operations, RPOs. Um, and it's not entirely clear um, what they're doing um, when they when they get really close to our satellites. Uh, they could be just trying to look at them and, and see what capabilities are on board, or they could be getting near to actually attack it. Um, that's not entirely clear. Russia has been using its electronic warfare abilities for quite some time, both utilizing jamming and spoofing of GPS in areas of interest, such as Ukraine, the Black Sea, and Syria. Russia has recently flexed its direct energy capacity, both in the Soko Eschulo Soviet-style plane with a series of lasers on its roof to target satellites, as well as publishing a series of videos and photos of truck-mounted laser vehicles. Its current operational funding and abilities are unknown, though it has been reported that they have illuminated a Japanese satellite in 2009. After the USSR fell, the US military and domestic reliance on satellites only increased, but their counter-space defenses through SDI no longer had any reason to be aggressively pursued. Much of the US's anti-ICBM approach pivoted to ground theater missile defenses. But something began to happen in the early 1990s. The United States was no longer using outer space just for strategic nuclear command and control. As we saw during the first Gulf War, we found out that space could be very helpful in conventional conflict. The United States has made space assets essential to our ability to fight and win a war. And so if one of our opponents wants to enter into conflict with us, one of the prime targets would be our space systems. We've made space essential to our security. How do you, you know, operate a drone from the far side of the world? It's through a communication satellite. And the drone is also using a navigation system to know exactly where it is, communicate with the pilot who's sitting in a computer terminal in Nevada or somewhere. Those systems all use communications and navigation satellites. And you weather satellites to understand what the weather over the you know, you know Afghanistan or Iraq or somewhere else. Is. So we developed a whole spectrum of munitions or, or GPS guide. You know, so you can hit something pretty precisely now because you can put a kit on the bomb, steer by GPS to hit something. The Chinese and the Russians see that we completely integrated on space systems in the military. And well, what would one of their main moves in a war be? It would be to, you know, probably take out, try to take out some of our key space systems so to blind or hobble the U.S. armed forces. In 2000, the Rumsfeld Commission would conduct a review of American space capacity eventually recommending forming a dedicated Space Corps under the Air Force, similar to the Marine Corps under the Navy. There's been a real discussion in military circles over the past several decades about how best you should do military space acquisition and how do you prioritize that. And so the idea was, that, okay, if you had a Space Force, or which I support a Space Corps or a Space Guard or some sort of branch of the U.S. military um, that was dedicated to promoting space infrastructure, acquisition, development of, you know, personnel, that sort of thing, then that would protect what is a key national security enabler for the United States. This was agreed to and set to begin moving into place until the September 11th attacks. This restructuring of the military priorities to the war on terror would draw resources away from fulfilling the commitment to creating a space dedicated program. 9-11 uh, really refocused a lot of U.S. Uh, security spending into Homeland Defense and with the Department of Homeland Security starting and um, Spacecom seen as less important. In 2017, a bipartisan effort was made to create such a space core, but fell short. This restructuring idea, however, was revitalized by one of the least expected sources. To immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch 
While there are a lot of areas of disagreement between Trump and Obama, one area of continuity is this focus on, one, enhancing the resiliency of our national security space architectures, and two, ensuring that we can operate effectively in the outer space domain in response to that emerging anti-satellite threat. While the original plan had some degree of bipartisan support in Congress in 2017, this effort was still not approved by all, including ranking members of the Air Force due to its concerns of budgetary redundancy. I know the media and public often sees these debates about what are we going to call people in the Space Force or what are their uniforms going to look like. and. And what we know about it, we saw in the Steve Carell show, which was fantastic, um, but not at all what the actual Space Force is charged with doing. So a lot of uh, the country's space operations had been, up until this past year, housed under the Air Force. With the division of the Space Force, what, what they did is both the Air Force and the Space Force fall under the Department of the Air Force. So it's kind of like the Marines and the Navy. Uh, the Marines fall under the Department of the Navy, but the Navy and the Marines are two separate forces. But there is this other thing called uh, uh, Space Command. So that's, I think, where people often get confused. Um, and you hear these terms com like d different Central Command, Indo-PACOM, in the uh, Indonesia Pacific Command. And what the job of the commands is, is to actually go out and fight. The job of the services, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Space Force, is to train, organize, and equip. So they train all, all, the, all the members, they organize them, they equip them, and then when you need to go fight, they get sent to these different commands and the commands actually organize the fight. So there's Space Command, which was recently, was also stood up again. It, there used to be a Space Command. It was stood down post 9-11, uh, and now it's back again. Um, so there's the Space Command whose job it actually is to quote unquote fight in space, whatever that looks like. And then the job of the U.S. Space Force is to train, organize, and equip um, the, the military members so that they're ready to get into that fight when, when the time comes. Um, so a lot of their efforts over the past year have been around organization. How are they going to organize themselves? So a couple of the tasks that they're sort of taking on are, are what we call space domain awareness. Um, which, you know, is what it sounds like. We're, we're trying to be aware of what's happening in the space domain. So that's everything from tracking um, what's up there in orbit, including debris. Um, this week, there's been a couple of near misses between satellites and debris. And um, so one of the things that they do is they track it. They, using satellites in orbit and ground-based radar and, and, and telescopes, you gotta track every piece that you can up there to make sure it's not gonna hit one of our satellites or the International Space Station. They're sort of cons also consolidating um, a lot of the other missions that the Air Force has traditionally had in terms of launches, in terms of space electronic warfare, satellite systems, so GPS systems. So I think of what a lot of what we've seen over the past year is consolidation. Uh, one of the motivations behind establishing the Space Force was to simplify the space acquisitions process. Um, all of the services do something in space. Each service acquires space systems independently. And so you see a lot of duplication and wasted effort. Um, and so one of the missions of the Space Forces have been to, to try and bring that all together, simplify it, um, find a way to make that process better. As of 2020, the finalized structure of the Space Force is made up of three fields of command, space operations, research and development, and military training and education. NASA and the Space Force have signed an MOU committing to collaboration whereby the Space Force may use NASA spacecrafts in partnerships with Boeing and SpaceX. They have made concerted efforts to say that it's gonna be flat, so not as a hierarchical. It's gonna be smaller, it's gonna be more agile, able to move quicker than some of the other services. But again, I, I fear bureaucracy grows um, so no matter how much you think limiting that is, is working for now, eventually it will grow. Um, so I'm not entirely convinced that establishing a whole new bureau bureaucracy to simplify the acquisitions process is actually going to work when the DOD has just been reluctant to do it in the first place, even though they've been mandated by Congress to do so. The actual capacity of the Space Force, or any of the United States space abilities for the last several decades, are hard to truly know due to the high degree of secrecy. 
The last official ASAT test was conducted in 1985. In the mid-1990s, the Clinton administration almost approved a satellite that's purpose was to destroy incoming asteroids that could potentially hit Earth, but was vetoed as a line item due to likely violating space treaties. During the 1990s, with the STEPTSX program, the US developed capacities to allow satellites to operate on autopilot for a number of weeks in case of attacks on space command centers. In 2005, the satellite USA 165 XSS 11 was believed by some to have been a ASAT co orbital device, though evidence of this claim are scarce. In 2008, after the 2007 China test, Operation Burnt Forest saw the US Navy use SM-3 missiles to shoot down a satellite. This however was claimed not to be an ASAT test, but rather a concern over a satellite that was leaking toxic chemicals that needed to be eliminated. It's not certain if this was motivated by ASAT test reasons or not. Amongst the most seen assets of the Space Force has been the Boeing X-37, which looks like a small unmanned space shuttle. Starting its early development in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it is capable of carrying loads into space while staying in orbit for long periods of time. Originally built to be taken on the space shuttle, it now is launched on the head of SpaceX and Atlas rockets while using plasma thrusters while in orbit. There has been three iterations of the device, each vastly improving on the last. Amongst academics, there has been increasing question on what the future of space development will bring. Some argue this will blossom into an era of cooperation, while others argue that a conflict or a war will be inevitable. One of the greatest concerns of a potential conflict in space is known as the Kessler Syndrome. The biggest fear it always is, let's say um, one country attacks another satellite, and that might give you a momentary advantage, but what happens to all the debris? if you're, you hit it kinetically. Um, that debris is gonna stay there. It might hit other satellites. Um, it, it could cause eventually this cascading sort of collision. Um, and if all of a sudden you destroy the orbital environment, you might destroy it to the point that you yourself will never be able to use it again. Um, anytime you create debris in orbit, you know, you know, if you have a weapons test or anything like that, you create trash in orbit or debris. And if it's a low enough altitude, eventually it'll come back down and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. But if it's a high enough altitude, it's going to be up there for a while, whether it's years, decades, centuries, or basically forever. And so, you know, imagine if you had a war where the bullets from the war were still whizzing around decades after the event. To a certain extent, that's what you could be talking about. Now, space is big. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie WALL-E. Basically, the idea there's a ring of debris, you know, circulating, circulating the planet, and WALL-E has to basically pop out through the debris, you know, to get past it. So a lot of people, when you talk about space debris, they think like that would be what's happening. That's not what would happen. What could happen is that certain altitudes or certain orbits, the potential for some sort of conjunction, what we call running into things, could become so great that it'd become too much of a risk to use. You know, right now, NASA has rules like a one in 10,000 risk, one in 1,000. So we're looking at, you know, the possibility that could be a much larger risk. And that, you know, just makes space more expensive and difficult to use over the long term. Uh, when I was Assistant Secretary of State, I would often meet with the Chinese to try to work with them on this issue of orbital debris. In one of the slides I would always bring would show the number of close approaches that have occurred to Chinese satellites from debris from China's 2007 ASAT test. And by the time I left government in 2017, there were well over a thousand close approaches. So that kind of brings the point, it's in everyone's interest to try to prevent the growth of orbital debris. In 2007 and 2009, there were two major debris generating events. The 2007 Chinese ASAT test, but in then in 2009, there was an accidental collision between a defunct Russian Cosmos satellite and a commercially operated Iridium satellite. Between the collision and China's ASAT test, those two events are responsible for one third of the debris in low Earth orbit. Imagine if we have 10 satellites explode in low Earth orbit during a war. If I were making a recommendation to the incoming Biden administration, take steps to strengthen the international norm against debris generating events in outer space because debris is a threat 
to the space systems of all nations. All space debris so far identified has been and continues to be tracked when able. When debris is coming near a satellite or a space station like the ISS, this tracking gives ample time for evasive maneuvers. Currently they're around, roughly, it keeps changing, but maybe let's say 3,200, so about 3,200 active satellites at present. But with the launch of mega constellations, where you're having tens of thousands of satellites being launched, we could potentially have 107,000 active satellites in the next 10 years or so. We're at the beginning stages of what that could do. The price of space is quickly lowering, with already in 2020 non-state actors such as SpaceX capable of sending people into orbit and vessels to Mars. While this risks the threat of other less cooperative states and non-state actors such as Iran or North Korea developing military space capabilities, this also opens the door for new innovations with increased access. Other countries are looking at it and saying, okay, maybe we should do this as well. You know, it's, it's not enough just to be um, a space power. It's not enough to be able to launch your own satellites. I think a lot of countries are looking at it and saying, okay, we need to have a national security space program. And just within the past year or two, this is a very recent phenomenon. There's been a real interest in developing this sort of capability, whereas previously, you know, developing some sort of space force was seen as, okay, you're going to immediately weaponize space. And I think to recognize that there's a whole spectrum of responses there. For as long as man is in space, it will continue to be a battle between identifying unintended actions or peaceful innovations with dual-use ulterior motives. Increasing tensions from unintended or intended signaling may lead to undue escalation. The U.S. tends to see escalation, so any kind of you know, counter space influence or you know, interference with space capabilities as one way. You escalate, you turn it up, you turn it up, you turn it up, and you know, it could lead to things going out of control, whether it's through misunderstandings or you know, deliberate intent. Whereas the Chinese, they look at escalation as a dial you can turn, right? As you can, you can increase pressure and you can decrease pressure, which is concerning because if the Chinese think they can increase pressure with the idea later on, they can decrease pressure and they can back it off. Whereas the U.S. sees escalation as only a one-way thing, you can see how the U.S. can see the Chinese doing something and interpret it as it's going in one direction, where the Chinese feel like they're sending a different kind of signal. There's a lack of trust, and without trust, it's very hard to enforce anything or even think about enforcement mechanisms. Do you personally feel that military confrontation in space is inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. I continue to believe that if we sit down and do a serious cost-benefit analysis of conflict in space, that we will come to realize that the costs of conflict in space are far too high to our global economy. Every country, save for maybe two, Iran and North Korea, are intimately tied into the global economy. And the global economy is predicated on space-based systems. You take down the GPS system, and that's an economic loss of $1 billion a day. A day with the, the losses only mounting over time. We think about what COVID's done to our global economy today. Think about what that a GPS going out would do to the global economy over time. It, it would be tragic. Um, so I, I, and that's just one example. And so I think if we actually sat down and thought about this a little bit more, um, we would realize that it, Engaging in active conflict in outer space has the potential of doing so much damage that could not be kept contained to one state or the other. It would inevitably spread throughout the global system. Um, and I think the costs are too high for what little benefits would come from knocking out one satellite, potentially. Um, so I actually am still hopeful that we can avoid this. It's going to take effort. It's going to take compromise. It's going to take time. Um, trust has to be established amongst Russia, China, and the United States in particular. Um, but it's a process we have to be willing to engage in.